good morning good afternoon or good evening to all the e aspirants so today we are going to start with the partnership chapter in partnership uh, what we are going to learn about is how the partnership is formed uh, how the partnership return uh, what all things are included in the partnership return like the schedule k's and the k1s uh, what are the transactions uh, that are incurred between the partnership and the partners and this is the important topic i can say because uh, the whole chapter is based on the transactions between the partnership and the partners then there will be a calculation of basis how the basis will be calculated from the point of view of partners and from the point of view of partnership firm uh, then we have unrealized receivable and inventory that is one kind of concept uh, which we will go through when uh, we uh, look at the distributions right when the partners take their distributions or when they liquidate the partnership so this concept will come in that after that we are going to look at the partnership distributions to the partners and how the disposition of the partners interest will happen in the firm so let's start with the first topic that is forming a partnership so as we all know partnership is formed by two or more people so any unincorporated organization why this word is used unincorporated organization because if you are a corporation right if it's already a corporation they can't be a partnership so any unincorporated organization formed with two or more partners can be considered as a partnership now who cannot form a partnership there are a list of uh, you know entities which cannot be considered as uh, which cannot be a partner or they cannot form a partnership if it's already incorporated as a corporation or a body corporate or a body politics under federal or state law then they cannot be uh, considered as a partner in a partnership also they cannot form a partnership if it's insurance company if it's a joint stock company or a joint stock association bank organizations wholly owned by the state or local government you know like llp llc i can say llc are initially formed at the state level right but they have the option they have the option to either consider themselves as a single member LL, llp llc i can say disregarded entity right or they can form a partnership okay but those who are wholly owned by the state and local government th this type of organization cannot be considered uh, you know as a partner in a partnership or they cannot form by their own as a partnership organizations required to tax as a corporation but obvious who are already decided to you know include uh, themselves as a corporation c corp then they cannot be a partner foreign organization tax exempt organization real estate investment trust and those organization were classified as a trust but remember this thing if the uh, you know there is a beneficiaries in the trust for the benefit of the, those people if the trust is entering into partnership then it is allowed so there is one exception in this if for the benefit of the beneficiaries they can enter into a partnership okay all right so let's look at the types of partnership partnership can be general or limited okay so if i talk about general partnership uh, where all the partners are general i can say okay so journal partner means what whatever they have contributed right for example a b c three partners are forming a partnership they have contributed x amount in a firm right so whatever they have contributed over and above this contribution they will have their liability if the uh, partnership has taken a loan from a bank or an institution right and that loan is over and above this contributed amount and if they don't repay the partnership firm don't repay then this partner will be personally liable in a simple language i can say their liability is unlimited okay so all the partners are journal in case of general partnership and they are liable for all the debts of partnership even if it's an excess of their contribution okay what what do you mean by now limited partners partnership so in case of limited partnership at least one is limited and at least one is general partner rest all have the option to either treat themselves as a limited or treat themselves as a journal but there's a rule at least one should be general partner means at least one should be liable for whole liability apart from his contribution okay got it this is this was about types of partnership and also these are the type of partners they can be the general or they can be the limited okay uh, now what what 
type of agreement like partnership agreement and if i talk about uh, as per the irs or as per us laws the partnership agreement there is no hard and fast rule they can either be a oral agreement or they can either be a written agreement but it's not mentioned over here but in case of limited partnership it has to be always a written agreement why because there is a limitation right at least one should be limited and at least one should be journal so this partnership limited kind of partnership should be in written okay it is preferable then uh, like if your original agreement is there and if you want to make any modifications any changes in your partnership agreement the shares you, uh, you know the profit sharing ratio whatever you want to change that can be done but before filing the tax return and excluding extensions right so if i talk about partnership what is the uh, what is the time limit to file the return it's 15th of march right how you can uh, remember this date is uh, in, if i talk about the individual tax returns right 1040 it's 15th of april okay we'll learn uh, in this chapter uh, more that uh, the partnerships are required to issue k wins right k wins to the uh, individuals those who are partners in the partnership form okay so remember this thing for individuals to get the k1 on time the partnership firm needs to issue it at least one month prior that's why it should be 15th march okay and extension so from this we'll calculate six month so from 15th march we'll take 16 six months that is that will be 15th of september till this date you can modify your agreement okay once your your filed the return once your uh, the extended due date has gone you cannot modify or make any changes in your partnership agreement all right so this was about the partnership agreement next is exclusion from partnership rule now what do you mean by this means whatever are rules of 1065 are there will not be applicable to those who have planned or who have decided or who have excluded themselves from the partnership rule okay this can happen in a few conditions first if the partnership is not actively conducting the business right second if they choose a complete or partial exclusion but to exclude themselves all the partners not not a single partner should disagree means all the partners should agree till how much date till the due date and any extensions means till 15th march or till 15th september all the partners need to agree that they want exclusion if they are not conducting the active business all right this was about the exclusion rules these were the basics now the main chapter is going to start about the partnership first is family partnership now uh, remember this thing from this topic i can say there will be at least one question so mark it as a category topic the family partnership what happens you know uh, if the fa father is there or the mother is there and if they are already carrying uh, you know a partnership firm or they are already having uh, they are already a partner in a partnership firm right and if they want to uh, give some of the share to the son or to their daughter right so in that case the family partnership rules will come into effect okay we have two bifurcations one is capital as a material income and second is capital as not material income right means what if you have invested the capital and using that capital you are generating the income means your capital is your material income producing factor right using that material only you are earning for example if i am uh, if we are running a you know retail company or retail uh, partnership firm means we are just buying the product and selling the product so to buy that product i have invested some capital for example i have taken some machineries or something using those i am producing my income so that is capital which is called as material income producing factor okay second thing is which is not a material income producing means what i am just using my knowledge i have not invested a capital i am i am accountant i am a tax preparer right 
I'm providing my services and I'm taking fees and commissions and you no know, other compensations for personal service which I'm performing. So in that case, capital is not a material income producing. So whatever I'm going to share you right now will be applicable only to the material income producing factor. Okay. Now let's take an example. If father is there, uh, he wants to give uh, you know, his partnership share to his son. All right. So in that case, how we are going to calculate what amount will be taxable to father, what amount will be taxable to son, how much will be the basis of son. For that, there is a simple formula which will be applicable only in this first case. It's not applicable over here. Okay, only in this first case. So in question, in exam, they will confuse that whether it's a material income producing factor or it's not a material. So just read it carefully whether it is or it is not. If it is a material income producing factor, right, then what you will have to do is apply this formula. First is we'll just simply take the partnership income, whatever is given in the question or uh, they might give a list of incomes, just, just total it out. We'll take the partnership income, okay. Then we'll reduce the reasonable compensation for the service that the donor rendered. So if I talk about the distributive share of the donor, now here donor means what son? What is what will be his distributive share? The question will be asked on this basis only. Either they will ask that what is the distributive share for the son, or what they will ask is uh, how much amount the uh, amount the father will include in his tax return. Okay, so let's see. First, we'll take all the partnership income. We'll reduce the reasonable compensation for the services that the donor means what the father might be providing some services to the partnership firm for which he will be getting paid right so we'll reduce that reasonable compensation and we'll get one amount from this amount what we will do is we'll uh, bifurcate it into two categories first percentage of donors interest still in the business means what like if uh, the part uh, father is having 50 percent share in the partnership firm he is just selling the 10%, right? So 40% is still in the business, right? So he'll just take the 40%, okay? And whatever is the remaining amount, that is the, uh, you know, called as the share of the son, of the Doni, I can say, okay? So this is about the distributive share of Doni, which we, while looking at this question, just to make sure you look at whether it's a material producing factor or not, okay? Next is, Partnership in case of married couple. Now, what happens if a husband and wife, right, taxpayer and the spouse, both are carrying on any business together and they share the profits and the losses together. So, can we call it as a partnership? Because, see, they have not done any written agreement or it's just an overall partnership. Can we call it as a partnership? Yes or no? For this, we need to see whether they are treating it as a qualified joint venture right they have the option to not treat it as a 1065 they can treat it as a qualified joint venture okay so to treating it as a qualified joint venture there are some requirements and all the requirements need to met first is only the member of joint venture are the married couples only the husband and wife are the you no know, partners in the partnership firm second both of them are taking filing status as MFJ. No, there are single MFJ, MFS. Remember the status. So they are taking MFJ as a filing status. Third, both spouse materially participate in the business. Right? They are active in the business. They materially uh, give their time in the business. So both the spouse should materially participate and both should elect this treatment. Which treatment to treat it as a qualified joint venture and not as a partnership. If they don't take the selection, right, they will be deemed treated as a partnership. Okay, so to save themselves from treating their, you know, business as a partnership, they can take a election that is qualified joint venture. All right, so what are the effects if they elect and if they don't elect? If they elect to be treated as a qualified joint Okay. Then both the partners means husband and wife, right? The taxpayer and the spouse.
कैन बी ट्रीटेड एज अ सोल प्रोपराइटर ओके सोल प्रोपराइटर मीन्स वॉट दे विल शो इट इन द स्केड्यूल सी ऑन टेन फॉर्टर रिटर्न now if you have done uh, you know individuals right part 1 is clear then you you can get this thing if you are treated as a sole proprietor right then in your individual tax return that is 1040 which you are filing obviously mfj right mfj there is a schedule c in which you will show it as all the incomes deductions credits which is divided amongst the you know partners will be shown in this schedule c okay now what if they don't elect if not elect to be a uh, you know qualified joint venture then carry the respective shares in the k1 means what they will just considered as a 1065 here they are not going to be considered as a 1065 and that's why it will directly shown on schedule c as a sole proprietor income but if they elect if they don't elect right if they don't elect then they will be deemed called as a partnership and if they are called as a partnership then they'll have to prepare 1065 return and the income will be distributed to both the partners right husband and wife in the form of k1s here from 1065 all the incomes will go to the schedule k we'll just come to it uh, after this topic just so all the incomes will go to the schedule k from schedule k respective share will be given to each partner in the form of k ones okay so clear this one uh, i don't think there are much questions from this topic but you can mark it as a b category topic okay just for uh, you know theory question might come so just have a look at this topic before your exams next is limited partnership so we have already done this uh if it's a limited and if it's a general partnership do remember we just started with that topic only so it's nothing important like that but uh, we have already covered it if it's a general partner okay they will be personally liable if it's a limited partner then liable to the extent the amount which they are contributing okay only whatever they have contributed what see i'll use the one word that is basis we'll come to it how the basis is going to be calculated and then in the this basis see initially the partner will bring bring some amount right as a contribution in that contribution there will be some addition there will be some deletions like uh, additional amount has been brought by the partner they take away some distributions there are some losses in the partnership form so it is adjusted for few amounts and then we come to an amount that is adjusted basis okay so up to this amount i can say up to this the partner will be liable not more than this but if it's a journal partner they will be personally liable like over and above this they will have to bring the money in the business if there is a you know liquidation or the liability is more okay so next is limited liability company what do you mean by llc uh we know s corp we know c corp we know partnership we know a uh, single disregarded entities right sole proprietor i can say and what do you mean by llc llc is a company which the people form at state level now if you guys are already aware about the uh, federal and the state so you should know that federal and state okay 1040 is filed on federal level 1065 is filed on federal level 1120 s corp 1120 c corp is filed on federal level okay so where the limited liability company will fall if the limited company uh, you know is formed then all the laws of state will be applicable to a llc now here the question is then in what category they will fall like at state they they are already following the rules and regulations but now they have to report their income to the federal level then in what category they will take so there are four bifurcations okay if the llc is having only one member for example i have started my own llc i am just only single person owning that llc okay so i can define it as a single member llc it will directly go to my 1040 individual return as a schedule c got it second two or more members are there they are forming llc 
right they can have the option to either treat themselves as a partnership right they can treat themselves as a escort or they can treat themselves as a seco okay they just need to file a form if they elect to treat themselves as a escort then 2553 is the form which they need to file C Corp 8332 is the form which they need to file if they are treating themselves as a C Corp. All right. So all the LLC owners we call them as a members, and their article of organization. See in C Corp there is a article of incorporation, but if I talk about LLC, it's an article of organization. Okay, they need to file. article of organization but since llc is recognized at state level so they will file to the respective state what article of organization all right and then they can decide whether they need to treat themselves as a partnership or s corp or c corp okay so moving to the next topic that is partnership return 1065 which we are going to start that um, how the incomes will be included in which schedule uh and uh, how it will be treated in the uh, partners tax return there will be at least i can say one or two questions based on this how they will ask they will just give you the list of incomes and expenses okay they will ask you that uh, you know what what will be uh, taxable to the partner in their 1040 form by way of schedule k1 remember one thing 1065 is just a reporting form okay partnership form do not uh, pay the taxes they just report their incomes and expenses okay now from this 1065 there are some incomes which are directly directly taxable like directly the partnership form will take into account so that we will call it as schedule k schedule k each and every incomes whatever the partnership form has earned will be shown on schedule k right whether it's ordinary income or loss rental whether it's a passive income right any sales of property anything x y z any income each and every income will be shown on schedule k okay so what is k1 from this schedule k we will bifurcate it amongst the partners partner a partner b partner c okay so each and every partner will have their own schedule k1 means it's a bifurcation of their own share schedule k i can say it's showing 100% income out of this a is having you know say 30% share 20% and 50% i can say so in this K one of A out of this hundred percent, only thirty percent will be taxable to partner A. Twenty percent will be taxable to B. So that bifurcation is done on Schedule K one. You got the difference. See, many people used to get confused. Though those who are not having like not having any experience in the US industry, they are just starting to study first. They usually get confused between K and K one. they think that schedule k and k1 are the same no it's not same schedule k is having 100% income and the bifurcation is given in schedule k1 all right so how the question will be asked means uh, what amount will go in the partners you know 10 for the return or what will be the total amount which will be shown on schedule k or okay, they will not tell the schedules but you just need to make sure read the question properly okay so let's see what's there in the k1s in k1s we have a different line items means what uh, whatever income and losses the partnership has earned okay so first is whatever income and losses the partnership form has earned second is portfolio income means i can say all the passive incomes which where you are not actively involved in earning that interest dividend royalties short term and long term gains okay then there's the deductions Uh, section one seventy nine deduction. This will go through in the corporation chapter, okay? Or business taxation, I can say business taxation. This we have this in detail. So one seventy nine deduction. Any other deductions which uh, the partnership 
is taking partnership firm is taking they will include it on the k1 means respective see income is going to be taxable to the partners and obviously the expense should be allowed to the partner for the respective shares so this is that's it uh, whatever income right the firm is earning they will show it on schedule k and from this schedule k it will be distributed to different partners by way of schedule k1s got it Second thing is what if if particular income is given you have to decide whether this income will go on schedule K only and K1 or only K1. Remember only one rule the first box which you are seeing here right now whatever is included over here will go only on schedule K. not this and this only the ordinary income and the guaranteed payment this two will directly go to schedule k means it will be directly reduced from the 1065 only and then it will be bifurcated to the partners guaranteed payment will come to it when we uh, look at the transactions between partners and the partnership form okay Portfolio income, deductions, everything will be bifurcated to the partners by way of K1. There was one more concept which came into picture right now like in 2021 and in 2022 uh, they have just excluded. There was a one line item which was there on the K1. Now they have just uh, you know, shown it separately by way of schedules. If your partnership firm is involved in the, you know, some transactions which are having international tax relevance, all right. If they're having international tax relevance, then they need to file K2 and K3. See, K2 is like Schedule K. As I defined, what, what, are, what all things are included in Schedule K, the whole 100% income will be included in Schedule K, okay. So, K2 is just the extension of Schedule K and based on the k2 the individual shares will be divided will be bifurcated to all the partners by way of schedule k3 so if i'm a partner in a partnership firm and uh, they are also having some international uh, you know, transactions and i'll receive two things one is i'll receive k1 which i'll include in 1040 and second i'll, I'll receive k3 got it so this was about schedule k and schedule k1 okay just make sure to solve some M mcqs on this because they are very straightforward mcq they'll just give you some uh, amounts for example uh, gross income is given then they'll give cogs okay so there's the ordinary income which you will come okay after reducing this then uh, you'll have a guaranteed payment okay so this guaranteed payment will come to this topic of just after this uh, two three topics will come to it how the guaranteed payment will be treated in partnership and in the hands of partners then there will be given some you know interest income some dividend income and some capital gains or the uh, ltcg and stcg will be given okay so you have to apply your mind that just make sure see they will give you a rough paper in exam so in rough paper you can make this chart 1065 and k1 i can say your directly schedule k and k1 okay so out of this what amounts are going to be shown on schedule k and what amounts are going directly to the k1 so here what we'll do is this ordinary income first it will be shown on schedule k will reduce some guaranteed payment from this okay then there will be a amount this will be then bifurcated to schedule k1 but if i talk about any other incomes as is interest dividend passive incomes everything will directly be shown on schedule k1 all the deductions see if i talk about the deductions right one section 179 deduction any other deduction like charitable uh, intangible drilling cost pensions everything whatever are the expenses which the partnership firm is incurring they will be directly be shown on schedule k but they will not go on schedule k got it this much don't get confused just solve one or two questions you will get through the topic it's very straightforward topic next is partnership losses 
Now, uh, if the partnership firm is incurring any losses, how that loss will be distributed? It has a stepwise manner. First, basis rule will apply. Means, whatever is their basis in the partnership firm. I just said right now, basis means what? Whatever contribution they have brought in the firm, plus or minus any additions or deletions, any incomes and losses, they will just add and less. Then we will come to a figure that is called as adjusted basis. So up to this basis, first we will set off the losses. Then at risk rule means what? If the partner has taken any loan to invest it in the partnership firm, means they are personally going to be liable. They are at risk. They have taken the loan, right? So they are personally at risk. So up to that amount, the loss will be set off. Next is passive activity loss rule. This, if you have uh, done the part one, then you might be aware about this rule. Uh, up to 25k, you can reduce, right? We'll come to this rule as well. Uh, there's a whole uh, different chapter in which passive activity loss rule is included. Then, if there is any access uh, which we can set off against the business loss limitation. So, these are the you know steps. Just remember, these are the steps in which the partner's losses will be bifurcated either it will be basis rule right first we have to consider the basis rule second at risk up to whatever amount they have uh, incurring the liability for the firm third is passive activity loss rule right if the uh, you know loss is related to rental property then passive activity loss rule will apply and then whatever is remaining they we can take it as a business loss limitation got it uh, then there's the one uh, when to file I, as I said earlier it's 15th March and extension is 6 month for extension the form is 7004. Now remember you don't need to consider the form numbers and everything to you know first exam purpose if I say no need to remember the form numbers or publication numbers and anything just go through the concept very well and make sure along with each topic you go through the examples. Because the examples will be fitted in your mind and that will only remember you the while in the exam you will just remember those examples and using that you will be able to easily crack the question okay next is required tax year now what happens if uh, partners are there right if three partners are there see there, there is no like strict rule or mandation that you need to use this tax year only you need to use calendar year only they can use fiscal year as well right now what happens if each and every partner are using a different rule or uh, different uh, you know tax years right if they are using for example calendar year they're using if for example fiscal year ending on 30th june if the other partner is using it as a fiscal year ending on 31st of march what will happen what problem will rise whenever the partnership firm will issue k1 right the income the income which uh, this particular partner will include based on calendar tax year. This partner will include on you know fiscal year which will be ending on 30th June. What what this partner will say that uh, see my year is ending on 30th June. Partnership form is having 1st of Jan to 31st of December tax year. So I'll just take six months of income while filing 1040. So remaining they will take in the next six months. Now this will be a deferring of the income, right? They are deferring the income tax. See, partnership firm has already given the schedule K1s. Partnership firm is saying you should tax the whole amount. But the partner is saying, no, 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 I am following six months. Like I am following fiscal year, which is ending on six, 30th of June. So I'm not going to tax the remaining uh, six month amount. Right. So to overcome this, what they have come is, they have came up with a rule that is deferring the amount. Like the partnership firm will use a year, right, which is having a very less deferral in the tax amount. Anyways, remember one thing, whatever the partnership firm is having, you know, if the partnership firm's year is ending on 31st of December, okay. And they have issued, uh, you know, I can say 2022, for example. They have issued K1, the partner, 
uh, till 15th of March 2023. So in which year they have received the K-1? It's 2023. Right? So when the partner will file a 1040 return, there will be a question whether they should include that K-1 in year 22 or 23 because the partnership form has earned the income in 22 but they have issued the K-1 in 23. So the answer is the year in which they received the K-1 that is 2023. In 2023 tax return, they will include this K-1 in the 1040 and make it taxable. They will not include in 22. But remember this thing, whatever is the partnership tax year, the whole amount. So it doesn't matter what uh, year the partner is following. Whatever is the partnership tax year, the whole amount, for example, 50K, the partner is receiving a K1, which is having an income of 50K. He cannot sit and bifurcate it in the, uh, you know, his own calendar year or his own fiscal year. He just need to include the whole 50K in his, uh, by using the K1 in his 1040 form, right, in year 2023. Means whenever the partner will be filing a 1040 form, he will include this 50k whole 50k okay so don't be confused on this topic as well it's pretty simple the day when you receive the k1 from your partnership firm just check which year is that okay that year in that year you will include the k1 in your 1040 form okay now, how the year will be decided? How the partnership forms year will be decided? There is a calculation which we call it as a deferral period calculation. We just have to do this. But before coming to this, there are three conditions. See, if you do, if you fall into these conditions, then there, there's a straightforward answer. If more than one partner are having same tax year, okay, they all are using calendar tax year. Plus, majority share no uh, is hold by is held by the same taxpayers means what a b and c all are using you know 31st of december see let's take another example 31st of december and c is using 30th of june a is having share of say 30 percent b is having share of say 40 percent and c is having share of 30 percent now in this case you will use this calculation but if I if I can say uh, if B is having fifty percent and C is having remaining fifty percent, so who is having majority shares? See, first we'll see who are having same tax year. A and B are having same tax year. Are their shares majority? Yes, it's eighty percent, which is obviously a majority. So partnership form will follow tax year ending on thirty first of December right c is having a tax year which is ending on 30th of june 50 percent the share is 50 percent is that majority as compared to others no because if i can compare 80 percent and 50 percent obviously 80 percent is majority so first part is saying it is a straightforward answer just take all the totals of the share of the partners using same tax year I can't total this two because this both are having a different tax year now. So I can't total this this two shares, but I have to total only A and B's share only because they are having same tax year. Total the share, right? If the share is higher, then use the tax year which these two partners are using. This is simple. Next, if there is no majority of share, means uh, like there are n number of see there is no limitation in the partners. Okay, the number of partners can be n. N number of partners can be there. So, if there is no majority, right, and you know, the tax year are also different. So, what we will see, those partners who are having interest of more than or equal to, see, this is equal to sign, okay, more than or equal to 5% in the partnership form. And, and if all those partners who are having more than 5% interest are using the same tax year, then we will use that that as a partnership forms tax year got it now what happened they didn't fall under the first condition didn't fall under the second condition what will happen we'll have to do this calculation what we'll do is 
For example, A, B, and C partner are there. Okay. We'll take the year ending. For example, B, this is having 31st December. This is having 31st December. C is having 30th of June. So we'll do A, all the permutation combination you have to first create. A, B, and A, C. So for A, the year is ending on December. For B, it's also December. So here, deferral period is zero, right? There is no difference between December and December. If I talk about A and C, for A, the year is ending on December. For C, the year is ending on June. So what is the difference between these two? What is the deferral period? For what, uh, you know, how many months they are going to defer the tax? They will have to defer the tax. So if I see the difference, that is clearly six months. So here it's zero, here is six months. So I'll just multiply it with the A's share. Whatever is A's share, say for example, it's 30%. I'll just multiply it by 30%. Same way you'll calculate for B. So for B, what will be the permutation? B and A. So you can say that here already it is taken A and B. I can't take B and A. It, is, it will be in the reverse. Let's take uh, here as a 31st March. Okay. So if I talk about first situation between A and B, right, it is December and March. So here the answer will be three months, right? Three months, right? And multiply by the, uh, you know, share that is 30 percent. But if I talk about the second scenario, B and A, so between March and December, what is the difference? How much will be the difference? It will be nine months, right? So that's how you are going to calculate all the comp first, uh, you know, write down all the permutation combination. A, B, A, C will be there, right? Then B, A, B, C will be there. Then C, A and C, B will be there, right? Then just calculate the difference of the year ending. At what month the year is ending? See, for partner 1, tax year ending you will take. For partner 2, what is the tax year for the partner 2? We'll take the difference, just directly multiply it with the partnership interest. This is how your step 2 will come. And then repeat it for all the combinations which we have created. Whichever is the lowest one, just go through this example, you will understand that. Whichever is the lowest one, right? Here it's 0.9. So 0.9 we have taken for SAM. So the SAM will, is following a partnership tax year ending on June. So for partnership firm, the tax year will be ending on 30th June. This is how the partnership tax year is calculated. Got it? First, you need to go through these two situations. If they are not falling under these two conditions, then only you have to do this big calculation. Else it's not required. All right. Next is filing penalties. If the partnership firm is no filing, not filing the 1065 form, right? Or if they are not providing the K1s or K2 or K3 to their partners, then they need to pay the penalty. Or if they are filing 1065, which is incomplete. See, these penalties will not going to be asked in the part 2 uh, examination. It is relevant for the part 3. But still, you should know the whole crux of partnership. See, my motto is no... You should get the whole thing uh, if you are uh, you know, going through that chapter. For example, you have started with the partnership. My target is that you should know each and everything about the partnership or each and everything about the 1065. Okay. So, what is the filing penalty? If they fail to file by the due date or extended due date. What is the due date? It's a 15th March or extended due date that is 15th of September. Then... Uh, there's a penalty of $210 each month, part of the month. And this is for maximum 12 months. If 12 months has passed and still the failure is continuing, then this amount will be multiplied by number of partners. So if the partnership firm is having 50 partners, it will be multiplied by 50. Okay. Next is if they have failed to issue the K1s or K2s to the partner, then the amount of penalty will be $280. For each and every failure and if that failure is you know willful like since uh, there might be a willful failure and the partner is asking for the k1s and they are not providing it then the penalty of 20 will increase to 570 or 10 percent of amount required to be reported on k1 now you remember what we are going to report on k1 
from the above section we have just gone through the schedule k is and k1 so whatever is going to be reported on k1 that income multiplied by 10 percent or 570 whichever is higher will be the amount of penalty if they fail to issue k1s to their partners okay if they fail to issue the k1s the 1040 return will get delayed right next is yeah this is some small topic that is partnership centralized audit uh, if I talk about 1065 form, you know, tax return, uh, we have 1065, in which there's one schedule B2. What happens? IRS has the authority to assess and collect the understatement of tax. Now, you have the option to not pay that tax, but make some adjustments on that taxes. That is imputed under payment, we can define it. So, what partnership firm can do, they can request to modify the imputed underpayment and they may elect to push the adjustment. Means, if the partnership, if the IRS is asking you to pay, say, for example, $1,000, right, as an underpayment, you can elect to push this $1,000, right, as an imputed payment. Instead of paying, you will not pay the penalty. See, paying the penalty is a different imputed adjustment is a difference so you will not pay the penalty you will ask them to adjust it as a imputed adjustment okay uh, what how you can elect this in schedule b2 if you look at the 1065 form schedule b2 there is one option where you can elect as a partnership centralized audit you can elect out for this in that designated partnership representative will be appointed each taxable year. For example, a partner A is appointed. Next year again, they'll have to designate a particular partner. It is not deemed applied. Okay. That since we have a uh, designated partner A in the year one, year two also he will be a designated partner. Each year there is a new designated partner representative who is representing the partnership firm. This election will be applicable only to the partnership firm who are having less than 100 partners. Okay, less than or equals to 100 partners. They can only elect on, no, they can only apply on schedule B2 in 1065 form to elect out of centralized audit. Next, uh, who cannot elect, there are type of partnership. If the partnership firm, right, has to issue K1s to this people, who are this people? If some other partnership firm is there as a partner in the partnership firm, this can happen, yes, it is possible. Remember the first page, the partnership firm is not mentioned anywhere, like who cannot be a partner, it's not mentioned here anywhere. So the other partnership firm can be a partner in a partnership firm, remember this thing. So if the K1s are required to be issued to other partnership firm, to a trust, to foreign entities, to a estate or a representative of a partner, then they cannot, they cannot have this election. They cannot elect out themselves from a centralized audit. And they will have to pay any waste penalty. Okay. Next is uh, transactions between the partnership and a partner. So, this is very important topic. Uh, from this topic only, the whole partnership weightage is uh, you know, carried on. So, before looking at this two topics, first I will like to take a uh, guaranteed payment. Okay. What do you mean by guaranteed payment? If a partner is a, you know, having some percentage of share in partnership form, what will happen? Uh, whatever partnership firm is earning the income, this share he will get for you know having the interest in the partnership firm. So, for example, one lakh is the income. Out of this one lakh, twenty percent is the share of say partner A. He will get twenty k. So, this is anyhow is going to get. But what happens now? Uh, no, they initially only decide like between the partner and the partnership firm there is an agreement that whatever is your profit whatever is your income i should get this much amount minimum payment they will call it as a minimum payment 
okay and this will be written in the agreement somewhere okay in the written agreement that minimum payment they are going to get right so based on this we are going to calculate what is the guaranteed payment the partnership firm is guaranteeing you that this much amount you are going to get that is the guaranteed payment and this guaranteed payment the partner will take you no know, the partner will include it as income and the firm will you know get the deduction firm will get the deduction on their tax return on you know while calculating the ordinary income okay so what happens you know partner why why they agree to minimum payment if the partner is performing some services or if they are providing capital for use right then the guaranteed payment will be made and it will be treated uh, you know as a amount as a deduction for the partnership firm and for partner they will include it as a income okay so uh, guaranteed payment we have to bifurcation first is allowed as a business expense as i said second is partners distributive share of ordinary income means they will included in the 10 for return in the k1 okay next is how we are going to calculate the guaranteed see this question will come in exam for sure this type of calculation will come in the exam that how what is the guaranteed payment what is the uh, you know they will either give you the minimum payment amount and they will ask you to calculate guaranteed payment or vice versa can happen they will give you the guaranteed payment so it's like the equation kind of thing just remember this formula i am marking it as a category just remember this formula this will help you in the exam when this type of question will come so guaranteed payment is equals to minimum payment if any means what if you know partnership firm has decided to give a minimum payment of say $5000 so my minimum payment is 5000 over and above my partnership distributive share i'll receive 5k if uh, the income is say um, i can say 3 uh, like whatever is the income out of this income my distributive share is coming just 3k right so i am going to get 3k but since we have agreed to receive a minimum of 5k right so on hand i am going to receive 5k minimum i am going to receive 5k out of this 5k 3000 was my distributive share so over and above this what is over and above this it's 2k right $2000 it is my guaranteed payment. I can define it as my guaranteed payment. Got it? Now, what happens? The reverse thing happens. Uh, if instead of 3K, you know, my share comes to 8K. My share comes to 8,000. So, see, partnership firm has agreed to give me 5,000 as a, a minimum payment. But the firm has, you know, taken uh, you know form has earned the income out of those income i am going to receive 8k over and above my minimum payment so i can say there is no guaranteed payment ultimately i am going to get whatever was dis uh, discussed that was 5000 but since the distributive share is 8000 so i can't say i am uh, not going to take 3k keep the 3k with yourself i just want my minimum payment no remember this formula okay whatever is your minimum payment minus whatever is your distributive share of partnership income will just reduce it whatever is the amount that is guaranteed payment okay if using this formula your um, answer is in negative then there is no guaranteed payment if it's positive then only it's called as a guaranteed payment. okay now you know the concept right the minimum i have uh, you know said that 5k i'm going to receive okay and whatever distributive share i'm going to receive if it is less than this 5k then over and above this distributive share that is my guaranteed payment but if i am already receiving above 5k i can't say that i am having any guaranteed payment it's just my minimum payment all right so yeah next is uh this is just that bifurcation uh that whatever is the partnership income whatever is the ordinary income of the partnership firm will reduce the guaranteed payment that means this amount okay 
If it's negative, we are not going to reduce it. If it's positive, then only we are going to reduce it. Reduce the guaranteed payment amount. Whatever is the amount we are getting, we will just bifurcate it among the partners by way of K1. Okay. And partner will separately take into account the distributive share or, uh, you know, or the losses to the extent of existed basis of interest. Once we go, come to the basis of the uh, partner, you will able to understand the word existed basis. Right now you might get confused, but once we come to that topic, you will able to understand what is existed basis. See, this is a revision lecture, guys. So, at least you might be aware about the basic terms, basic terminologies, right? Next is health insurance. Okay, so this is also one important one. Uh, if the partnership firm is, you know, paying the premium for taking the health insurance of the partners, then there can be two scenarios. Either the partnership firm is paying on behalf of the partner, means here is insurance company, here is a partnership firm, here is the partner. Insurance company, partnership firm and the partner, okay. So, there are two options. Either partner can directly pay to the uh, you know insurance company second partnership firm on behalf of the partner is paying to the insurance company the premium for the health insurance right so both will be treated in a different manner if the partnership firm is paying on behalf of the partner then that amount of premium will be treated as a guaranteed payment and it will be reduced as a business expense we saw here right minus guaranteed payment it will be allowed to reduce as an expense if the partnership firm is paying to the you know insurance company on behalf of the partner the premium amount okay and uh, on the other end what the partner will do partner will just include his gross income in his 1040 return same treatment as we do for a guaranteed payment it will be taken in that manner now vice versa is happening Second scenario, if it is paid by the partnership, right, plus reduced from the distributive share of partner means what if uh, I am anyhow going to pay, you know, partner uh, $10,000 as a distributive share. But the partnership firm has paid $1,000 as a premium, right, to the insurance company. Then I will reduce this 1000 from the distributive share and I will give net on hand I can say. I will just reduce that 1000 which the partnership firm has given to the insurance company and I will just directly pay. The firm will directly pay 9000 to the partner. In the second scenario if this is happening right if this is happening the partnership cannot deduct the premium but obvious it's but obvious see anyhow from 10,000 from 10k they are reducing 1000. So, they are taking a reduction of 9,000, right? So, they cannot again take a deduction of this 1,000 again on the tax return. On the 1065 form, they cannot reduce the 1,000 from the ordinary income. But in this scenario, what is happening? It is paid by the partnership on behalf of partner, right? Directly and they are not going to reduce anything from the distributive share. So, distributive share is any way is going to remain 10 k Either you can reduce from your distributive share or you can just directly pay it to the uh, you know, insurance company and not elect to deduct it from the distributive share. This is happening then it is called as a guaranteed payment. First scenario, just go through it. Second scenario means paid by the partnership plus, plus it is getting reduced from your distributive share. Got it? The partnership cannot deduct the premium right when they are calculating the ordinary income they will not reduce it so this was second type of transaction first transaction which we did between the partner and the partnership was guaranteed payment second there can happen a premium for health insurance right third kind of transaction is sales or exchange of property okay if partner a is there right and partner b is there a and B are related and if there is any loss in this transaction that will be disallowed. Now what B is doing? 
B is selling that same property to some unrelated person, unrelated party. Then there will be a gain. So the whole gain will not be taxable. Out of this gain, whatever was previously disallowed in this previous transaction will be reduced and whatever is the remaining will be taxable. So let's put this topic, this scenario into the partnership, uh, you know, uh, rules, I can say. If the interest in capital or profit of a particular partner is more than 50%, directly or indirectly, what do you mean by directly or indirectly? Means if a corp, in, directly you know, but what is indirectly? If a corporation, trust, partnership, estate, this all things, this all corporation, trust, partnership, estate are owned by or for the shareholder, partners or beneficiaries, right? Or else I can say if individual is there and my family members, whatever, who is the partner, their family members. There is a the limited definition of family in case of partnership. It can be only the brother, sister, half-brother, half-sister, spouse and sisters, lionel descendant. See, mother and father are not included here in indirect relation in case of family. So they will not be considered, see, in question how, the, how they will ask us, they will just give the, uh, you know, some relations and they will give some percentage that this individual is holding this much percentage in the partnership firm. There will be also mother and father included over there. So you need not have to take their share while calculating the 50% share only in case of partnership. Mark my words, only for 1065, the definition of family is different. Brother, sister, half-brother, half-sister, spouse, ancestors, and Lionel descendant. Got it? What do you mean by Lionel descendant? Lionel descendant is whoever is after you, means your son, son's son, okay? Grandson, I can say. They are called Lionel descendant. Ascendant means what? Your father, your grandfather. So, that, that are ascendants. The ascendants. Ancestor, I can say, the other word is used over here is ancestors. So, your Lionel ascendants, your Lionel descendants, spouse, brother, sister, half brother, half sister. Only this much will be included as the definition of family if I take into consideration the 50% calculation, you know, shareholding or interest in the partnership. So, if first you will just total it out that whether your holding is 50%. Directly, indirectly, yes or no. Okay. If it is, then this rule will apply. Whatever we just saw right now is, if there is a loss, right, for partner and partnership, it will be disallowed. And it will be reduced from the partnership basis. We will come to the basis later on and we will again link this topic to that uh, basis uh, one. Okay. If it is a gain, Right, and more than 50% capital and profit is held by a single partner. If yes, then that gain we will be considering it as an ordinary income. If I'm not holding 50%, I'm just holding 48% or 20% or 30%, and this gain will be called as a capital gain for me, and capital gains tax rate will be applicable and not as an ordinary income. Did you get it? Uh, I can say it's a B category, but you just need to go through this concept very well. Just go through a few questions. See, before knowing the concept, if you directly jump into the MCQs, you'll get confused and it will demotivate you. So it's better to go through the whole concept in this manner and then jump over to the MCQs. It will give a confidence right okay so now i know the concept now i know how much will be disallowed and why it is disallowed and how much will be allowed uh, and how much gain will be taxable okay so understand this concept there's two related parties if the transactions happening between the two related parties the loss will be disallowed right and if that related party is selling the same property to some unrelated one then obviously there will be a gain. We'll just reduce the disallowed loss which was previously disallowed in the transaction. So this is the concept. Okay.
so for defining the related party yes or no like whether whether the person is related in, if i talk about the partnership whether the partner is related to the partnership firm we will not see just the capital or profit directly we'll just see whether it's holding indirect interest or not for taking it as an indirect interest we had this definition okay so this was about the third type of transaction which the partner which can happen between the partner and the partnership that is sales or exchange of property in case of related parties next is uh, we are going to take this topic in the next session that is contributions and distributions i'll take that in the one session only how much amount the partner will going to contribute how much will be taxable what will be the basis how much will be distributed so this two topic will be covered in the next session so yeah thank you guys for for today like that's it for the day Thank you.